Welcome to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am and we are so pleased to see you all this morning. We are a small congregation, but we are connected by love. So whenever and wherever you are, please feel this love together this morning. May the peace of our Lord Jesus be with you. And please wear your mask and glove when you go grocery shopping. And please keep distance by anybody for your safety and your family. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God as we receive this morning's prelude. Please join with me in call to worship this morning. God has given us this beautiful earth with all that grows in its soil and runs upon its land and swims in its water. Thanks be to God! God has given us breath to live and spirit to sing. God has gathered us into a community of care and worship. We worship God with love, thanksgiving, and praise. Please join with me the prayer of confession, silent prayer, and assurance of God's pardon. 
Let us confess our sins. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forget what our lips tremble to name, what our heart can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and match through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Believe the good news. God is our refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in times of trouble. God is with us. In Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. From time to time, people ask about passing the peace. It, it comes from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians and again in one of his other letters. Uh, Paul says this, the churches of Asia send greetings, Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord. All the brothers and sisters send greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, okay, we don't kiss anymore. Actually, some of our married couples sometimes kiss, but most of us just shake hands. And now with, with the pandemic, we can't even do that. We simply extend the peace of God to each one of you that's watching this day. And I hope you will extend Christ peace to those in your family and those that you know and your acquaintances because we really are blessed by God to be a blessing, to extend the peace of Christ to one another. It's not a kiss. It may not even be a handshake, but it is the peace of God be with you all. Amen. And now our reading from the book of Romans, chapter 11, verses 1 through 2a, and then 29 through 32. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham. 
a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so have they now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Scripture reading today is from Genesis 45, verses 1 through 15. We conclude our readings from the book of Genesis today. Genesis 45, 1 through 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of the Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, Come, come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep you for many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, hurry, and, and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near you and your children, and your children's children as well as your flocks and your herds and, and, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and, and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin and they that are in my own mouth, listen, listen, for you must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you must have seen. Hurry, hurry. Bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Reading from Genesis 45, verses 1 through 15. You have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. 
those words of Joseph to his brothers, we said last week, are the lens that provides the focus for the entire book of Genesis, or at least from Genesis 12 to Genesis 50, from the call of Abraham to the very end of the book of Genesis. You meant it for evil, but God, God meant it for good. We saw how Joseph, 17 year old going on 12, was a, a brat, he, he was obnoxious. His brothers hated him and, and, and finally planned, plotted to kill him. And at the last minute, instead of killing him, they threw him down in a pit. And then when some traitors came along, they pulled him out and, and sold him for $20, something like that, 20 pieces of silver. And, and he went on his way to Egypt as, as a slave. But from that episode to chapter 45, Joseph has come to Egypt as a slave. He has been in Potiphar's house, the captain of the guard. He has been accused of seducing, raping Potiphar's wife, and he's been thrown in jail. He has had all kinds of terrible things happen to him, but eventually, eventually through a series of dreams, he has become the chief of staff or the prime minister, the right-hand man of Pharaoh, he is in charge of everything. And when there is a famine in the land, Joseph's brothers come down from Canaan, desperate for food, for, for something to, to keep them going for a little longer. And Joseph, recognizes them and he goes through a number of situations but finally he he reveals himself to his brothers as we read in chapter 45 today I am Joseph your brother the the one you sold into slavery so many years ago I, I am Joseph how's dad how how are y'all doing were they happy to see him? No, they were terrified because they just knew that, that Joseph would kill them, probably a slow, agonizing death to repay for what they did to him so many years before. And that's where he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant to plan this out so that you would be saved. You would not die of starvation in the famine. I would be in charge of Egypt and you could come and you could move in here and you can live and prosper here. God meant it for good all along from the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now the 12 sons, we see how God has been at work. God called Abraham to be blessed, but more importantly, to be a vehicle of blessing for all the nations of the world. And that promise was carried down from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and now to the 12, a vehicle of blessing, a, a way that God can use to, to bless all peoples, all peoples of the world. And if the 12 sons or 11 sons die out in a famine, the promise dies with it. So this is God's plan. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We saw last week ways that we can look through those lens of faith 
and focus on how God can use things for good. Certainly God did not cause the pandemic. God did not cause the economic problems that we are having. God did not cause this, but God can use it for good. Just one example we mentioned last week. Our small church would have never, ever started broadcasting to go online had we not been forced to by stopping our regular worship services in person in this room. God used that so that we now can reach out beyond this room to friends all over the world. God meant it for good. But today I'd like to focus on a particular part of God's plan. We noticed that Joseph revealed himself to the 11, his brothers, and, and talked to them about being reconciled to coming back together. He, he wanted them to be all part of one family yet again. And reconciliation is an important word throughout the scriptures and, and in our society. We are having uh, demonstrations, protests, disruptions. Uh, as I speak, there are people that are concerned about a Black Lives Matter painting on the street in downtown Tulsa, and there are people that want it, and there are people that don't. And, and there are all kinds of concerns, and there's all kinds of ways that we need to be reconciled, brought back together, as opposed to pulling apart. Reconciliation. Now, there are some people that say reconciliation is a distraction today. Reconciliation has to do with individuals being reconciled. And, and people might say, well, I'm not prejudiced. I'm not a racist. And, and therefore, this is not a problem. And other voices are saying, yes, but there is systemic racism as well as individual prejudice. Now, I want us to focus on individual reconciliation today, but we need to understand why some people are saying that's not enough. That's not enough. Let me use an example from years ago. Uh, so perhaps it will not be controversial as systemic racism and white privilege raise controversy today. I grew up in a southern city, in a segregated southern city. White schools, black schools, white drinking fountains, sometimes black drinking fountains, everything was segregated. And in the school system, it was said that it was separate but equal separate but equal. I had a cousin who was a principal of a grade school, and when the federal government forced desegregation in the 1970s, uh, he was assigned to what had been a black elementary school. And when he got there, he said, this is awful. They, they, they don't care about education. They don't have anywhere near enough textbooks and the ones they have are all beat up and they're out of date and, and they don't even have enough cleaning supplies, they don't have enough janitorial staff. These blacks, Negroes is what the word would have been at the time, they, 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 they just don't take care of their school. And another relative of mine that would have been probably considered a segregationist. She certainly wasn't a racist, but she was brought up in the segregated South. And she said to my cousin, whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? 
The school superintendent is white. The entire school board is white. The staff is white. The people in that school had to take the leftovers, just what they could get. It may be called separate but equal, but it is certainly separate and very unequal. That's systemic racism. And you can look back years and years in the segregated South and you can certainly see it. We need to be aware of people that still see that today. But I don't want that to distract us from personal reconciliation because that's what this scripture is about. There are other scriptures that talk about justice. Certainly the Hebrew prophets knew the abuse of power and privilege. Remember when the prophet Nathan went to King David and said, you are the man, you are the one who committed adultery and murder. Or when the prophet went to King Ahab and Jezebel at, who had conspired to, to murder Nabob in order to get his vineyard, you're the one, you're the one. God is not blind just because you are in power and you have privilege. So there are many passages in the scriptures that speak of justice. But today I want us to think of reconciliation of Joseph and his 11 brothers and eventually Jacob coming down to notice Notice that the injured party, Joseph, who was sold into slavery, makes the overture to his brothers. He reveals himself and, and he tries to bring them back together. And, and they, they are reconciled because they're hugging and, and they're kissing and they're crying and, and particularly Joseph and Benjamin are weeping together because Joseph and Benjamin were full brothers. They were the sons of Rachel. So they were particularly close. But they come back together. And isn't that what reconciliation is all about? Whether we're talking about brothers or husbands and wives or uh, parents and children, reconciliation is overcoming the, the barriers that separate us emotionally and coming back together. That, that's true of individuals, it's true of families, it is also true of the church. The Apostle Paul frequently talks about the problems within the churches under his care. In Corinth, he was concerned about the wealthy that ate up all the food before the poor could get there. He was concerned about factions that were uh, looking after one or another group of people. Uh, he was concerned for overcoming the barriers, the wall of separation between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. We don't often read those scriptures that way, but go back and see how many times the Apostle Paul speaks of the importance of reconciliation and unity in the life of the church. Jesus, in what we call the high priestly prayer before he was crucified, prayed that they may all be one. They may all be one. So reconciliation is an important theme running throughout the Bible. And in a way, if you think about Joseph coming to his brothers, it, it is like God coming to us in Jesus Christ. Joseph's coming to his brothers was completely, fully graceful. He didn't have to. 
He didn't wait for them to beg him. They didn't, he didn't wait for them to, to seek repentance. He, he didn't wait for them. He reached out to them as God reaches out to us in Jesus Christ. But you know what? The brothers couldn't quite believe it. They, they were afraid. They, they were scared. They, they, they thought, okay, maybe this is an act. He, he's being gracious now, but, but how long will that last? And he tried again and again to say, don't blame yourselves. Don't get angry at each other. This is God's doing. God is working his purpose out from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob to, to, to us today. God is working his purposes out. Accept his grace. And they sort of did. They sort of did. But from chapter 45 to chapter 50, they have brought their father Jacob down to live with them. And then Jacob died. And they thought, uh-oh, that's it. Joseph has been kind to us because of Father Jacob. Now we're back in trouble again. And that's why Joseph has to repeat what he says in chapter 45, again in chapter 50, because they cannot believe it. They simply cannot believe it. I think you and I sometimes or that way about God's grace. We can't believe it. Actually, we, we would prefer a, a, a contractual relationship. Okay, God, I will tithe, well, maybe not 10%, but a good bit. I will give, I will be in worship every Sunday. Well, not now, of course. I, I will listen online, well, when we don't sleep in. But, but God, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And, and, and you've got to love me. You, you've got to heal my cancer. You've got to do what I want. We would prefer God to be less gracious and where we can bargain with him. And it doesn't work that way. We have nothing in our hands that we can bring solely to the cross we cling. All the old evangelical hymns, most of which have been forgotten or are not sung anymore, speak of our sinfulness and God's graciousness. Isaac Watts, 300 years ago, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head to sinners such as I? We, like the brothers, cannot quite believe that Joseph could be so forgiving, so caring, so determined to reconcile and you and I have trouble believing that about God. And yet that is the good news, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's the good news of this. From the call of Abraham through the end of the book of Genesis, it is the story of God's blessing using particular people like you and like me, like, like all of us to be a blessing for mankind. We are blessed to be blessed, to be a blessing for the world, to help them come to know God's love in Jesus Christ. For for you and for me and, and, and for all of us. Open yourself.
give yourself to the Lord. As you are blessed, see how you can be a blessing in this very difficult time. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we see the dark clouds of the virus, the economy, of, of the uncertainties that surround us. Will schools open? Will businesses reopen? Will, will the economy pick back up? We, we are afraid, Lord. We are like those brothers centuries ago. We want to believe. We want to believe Joseph is gracious and forgiving and loving, but we still have doubts. We want to believe that you will see us through, but it's hard to believe. Lord God, help us stand by us, guide us, undergird us through these difficult days, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
We are so glad you joined us today. We feel like we are one part, only one small part, of God's church all around the world. And as we worship online, we are able to connect with folk all over. We, we are glad that you joined us this day. And we pray that as you go through this week, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you this day and every day. Amen. out in the power of your spirit as we've received may we freely give send us out send us out send us out for your glory that's all we do we praise to you send us out for your Send us out.